So let me start with correcting, uh, with correcting something which I said yesterday, which I did wrong. It was a big, huge execution deserving mistake. Um, bad, bad to be, sorry for that. So, so when we were proving the equivalence principle and we were doing this counting argument, and I was saying, well, we can always find a coordinate transformation which transforms at a point my metric to the flat metric. Of course, I used the inverse transformation, which was <laughs> unexcusable. So anyway, so this is the transformation to the new coordinate system. I, I have some matrix elements A, alpha, beta, and I do this uh, Taylor expansion. So I truncate the series at the order of at the linear order. And then, of course, there is the corresponding inverse uh, with, with, with the inverse matrix A tilde. So now this is the correct transformation of the, of the, of the metric under the coordinate transformation. Um, and so what really enters here is not A's, as I wrote yesterday, but it's A tilde. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the correct thing. So now you require that this is equal to eta alpha beta. Of course, then everything goes the same way. I have 16 of these. Um, I have only 10 equations to satisfy, so I can always find these A tildes, but of course they are just inverse to A, so, so if I find A tildes, uh, I just find A's as well, there's 16 of A's, um, and I can find these by inversion. So the counting argument still works, but you know, this, was, this was wrong, and as I said, execution deserving mistake, so <laughs> sorry for that. Um, very good. So then we discuss the parallel transport, and so then you say, so you have a curve gamma, which is parameterized by a parameter lambda. And this curve gamma has a tangent vector u, another u. And then you say that another vector v, another vector field v, is parallel transported along this gamma. So it's basically dragged along the gamma, provided that the following equation is satisfied. So v dot equals to 0. But what you really mean by that is that you take a directional derivative in the direction of u of v alpha. And so this, when this is 0, you say that v is parallel transported along gamma. OK. So now let us consider two vectors. So let v and w are parallel transported, parallel transported. Um, along gamma, so we have that v dot equals to zero and w dot equals to zero. So th then you may look at their scalar product. Okay, so then if you look at the scalar product uh, and look whether that's also parallel transported, so v times w, this is the scalar product. Well, what it really means is that I have d over d tau, d over d tau, and then v alpha, w beta, g alpha beta. So that's what scalar product means. I'm just using the metric to define the scalar product of two vectors. So by the way, notice that if you have a vector and you have a covector, you can contract these two, and you don't need a metric because they already have one index up and one index down, and I just set them equal and sum over these, and so I don't need uh, any metric. But if you have two vectors, there's no way to contract, contract the indices unless you have the metric. Okay, so that's what you call the scalar product. So anyway, so now we know that this derivative, of course, we, we have to differentiate three terms, and so we will have three, uh, three, well, using the Leibniz group, you have three terms again. Um, however, when dx on this guy is 0, when it acts on that guy is 0, so the only non-trivial quantity which you get is v alpha w beta d g alpha beta over d tau. Um, but of course, I can write this as using that property over there. So it's, let's say, u mu uh, nabla mu g alpha beta. 
So now it would be really nice property if, uh, as you drag these, these vectors uh, along the curve, so I have vectors like that, and their scalar product basically tells me about uh, the angle between them, and then I parallel transport later on, and I look at these vectors, it would be really nice if the scalar product actually did not change as I parallel transport. Okay, so you require that this is equal to zero, so uh, zero, and this would be nice. And so in order to do this, and this must be true for any vector, v alpha and w beta, um, so the only possibility how to arrange for that is that this guy is actually zero. And so you see that really it's the metricity condition. So we introduce this metric, metricity tensor M, al M mu alpha beta, which was nabla mu g alpha beta. And so we were setting that equal to zero in order to have nice connection. But you see that one of the reasons why you are setting this equal to zero is that the parallel transport actually has nice property. Namely, it actually preserves whatever the scalar product was uh, in between the two vectors. Okay, so, so the angle is basically preserved as you parallel transport uh, two vectors. Is that one question? Yes? So we talked about vectors at a point before, but now, of course, we are dragging in along. Are we talking about the continuous? Vector fields, vector fields. The vector fields. Yes. So, so, so it's like, so vector at a point is simply, you know, a co uh, collection of n numbers, if you want. And so now you extend it to the whole manifold, so you always have to specify you know, where on the manifold I am, so you specify the uh, coordinates of the point P, and then you specify what is the Continue. what is the uh, what, what is the vector itself. So it's actually now a vector field. Yeah. Yeah. It's in the tangent space, and it's yeah, yeah. So you should be thinking about the vector fields as defined in the whole manifold. It's simply you know a vector which lives everywhere in uh, in the space time. So now my big mistake is gone, so no mistakes anymore. <laughs> All right, so, so if it preserves the angle, um, we can draw this very nice picture. Um, so parallel transport, parallel transport along a loop. So let us first consider simply the flat space, and let me consider loop to be strange loop, but so that I can draw it nicely, let's, let's consider, so it's flat space, flat space, and then let me consider the loop to be simply a triangle, it's strange loop, but anyway. Um, and so the triangle is composed of straight lines, and so, so these are geodesics, and so the tangent vector of the geodesic is always parallel transported, along the geodesic. So now I choose another vector, my vector v, and I choose it this way. And then I'll just parallel transport it along this line, along that line, and along that line back to the same point. But the statement is that the angle has to be preserved with whatever the tangent vector of my, of my geodesic is. So it means that if there is a right angle here, so if I, as, as I drag this vector along this curve, so I'll be Checking this way. So the angle has to be preserved because there is a tan tangent vector here and the angle has to be preserved in between them. So as I transport it this way, the angle remains the same. Then I can transport it along this guy, and again, the angle will remain the same. Uh, and finally, I transport it along that guy, and again, the angle has to, this, this angle has to be the same as that angle and so on. So actually, if you come back, you see that you arrive exactly at the same vector as you started with, okay? So vector stays the same, same as we parallel transport it along a closed loop in flat space, okay? So now let's look at the similar picture 
but now let's say on the sphere so that it's easy to draw. Well, not really. Um, so this is my sphere, S2. And then I have, let's say, the equator. And then I have the big circles, one of them here and another, another one here. So now I'll choose my, my loop to be this thing here. So this is my loop. Okay. And again, I start with a vector which looks like this. This is my vector v. So I first go along this curve. So, so I'll, again, I'll be doing this thing here. And so I preserve the angle. So again, tangent vector goes like this. So, so here it's still the right angle. Okay. But now I transport along this circle. That's also a geodesic. So now it's getting twisted a little bit. Okay, so it's always showing the tangent thing. And finally, I transport on this guy, preserving the angle. And you see that when you come to the same point, the vector rotated to some angle v tilde, uh, to some new vector v tilde. Okay, so vector rotates as you, as you parallel transport it along the closed loop. Uh, so now vector rotates. And so as you will see, the rotation of this vector is really a manifestation of the, of the fact that this surface is curved. So you, so everybody intuitively understands that the surface on the sphere is actually curved, and it has some non-trivial curvature. Um, and so you can sort of measure this curvature by saying, well, if I transport along a closed loop, actually the vector doesn't come back to the same vector, but it slightly rotates or something like that. Uh, does this closed loop does this closed loop have to be made of geodesics? Um, I was, yeah, I, I simplified my life as, as a, no, it doesn't have to be. That's the answer. Uh, whatever the closed loop you consider, simply you just consider the parallel transport of the vector. And if it comes to the same vector as it was before, and if this is true along any, any closed loop and for any vector, then the, then the, then the space is flat. Okay. Otherwise, it, it is curved. But here, I you know, simplified my life to, to, to consider geodesics, the big circles, so that, so that actually I know that I always preserve the same angle with the tangent vector. And so, so that's why I could plot it this way. Does this depend on torsion vanishing? Um, yeah, I'm assuming torsion vanishing. Yeah, yeah but, but I mean, so if we assume that the, our connection is not symmetric, and right. plug it into the geodesic, geodesic equation, we get the same geodesics because the... Um, you... In general, you get different... Well, OK. If the torsion is completely anti-symmetric, so you know that torsion has three indices, alpha, beta, gamma. so so. By definition, it is anti-symmetric in the beta and gamma because it's just an anti-symmetric part of the connection. But, but it happens that sp certain torsions, and especially those which appear in string theory, are completely anti-symmetric. There are some three forms. Okay, so, so then if you lower the index alpha, and then all of them are anti-symmetric. So if that is the case, the geodesics remain the same. Okay, so, so you can show that, that it doesn't modify the geodesics. Okay, I'll... Yeah, we, we can discuss this later. All right, so, so really this would be a manifestation, manifestation uh, that space is curved, whatever that means. That's an intuitive thing, and we will actually use this as a definition of what curvature means. Um, however, before... I go that uh, go there. Um, I still am in the section of parallel transport. Um, so let's call this uh, first look at killing vectors. So killing vectors are special ve vector fields in the in space time in the manifold that describe symmetries of that, of that manifold. Um, and you can, you can really define them that way. So you are really looking at the space-time, you're looking at the metric, 
and you are looking for special directions, if you follow these directions, the metric does not change. And that's the definition of the corresponding vector field. That's a special vector field in, in the space time, and it's called killing vector field. Uh, you will discuss it in your tutorial, so that's the proper way to introduce them. But there is a shortcut, and that's through geodesics. Um, and so, so let's do it here, and it's probably the simplest way how you can introduce killing vectors. So let gamma be a geodesic, geodesic uh, with tangent vector tangent uh, vector u. Um, and so we know that uh, u dot equals to 0. Then let psi be another vector, uh, another vector. And let me form a quantity, let's call that quantity C, to be simply a product, scalar product of this vector psi uh, with my tangent, with my velocity u. Okay, so this is u times psi by definition, so it's u alpha C, C alpha. Okay, so let's consider such a quantity here. Um, so now what you may be asking is, is this quantity actually, so this is a scalar quantity, okay? Question is, as you drag this quantity along the geodesic gamma, is, is its value the same or not, okay? Does it actually, so the question is, let uh, this C be such that we have that C dot along the curve is equal to zero. So that actually it's an integral of motion if you, if my, if my gamma describes some trajectory for a particle, for example, then you are asking, can I form such a quantity such that uh, this preserves the value of this, for example, conserved energy. Okay, so this is what we require. Uh, require. So now, what is it we get? So, of course, this is nabla u acting on u alpha psi alpha. Um, and so we have to differentiate two terms. So we have. Uh, Nabla u acting on u alpha, and then psi alpha, and then the other term, let me write it more explicitly, it's uh, u alpha is whatever remained, but u beta, nabla beta, psi alpha. Okay, so these are the two terms which we are getting. Uh, okay, the first, and then this is the second, just writing nabla u in this way. Okay. So now we know that u is a geodesic, and so this guy is automatically zero. Um, and so we require that this is zero, so we require that this term is also zero. But if you look at these terms, say so if you have u alpha, u beta, so this is a, an object which is symmetric in alpha and beta. Um, so this object, if it had anti-symmetric part, it doesn't matter. So I can also symmetrize here, and it's the same thing. Okay, so you have nabla beta psi alpha symmetrized, and you require that this is true. Uh, this, uh, this is zero, and it's zero for any geodesic. So if true for every geodesic, then the only possibility is that nabla alpha psi beta equals to zero. So of course this has factor one half, because I define the symmetrization as one half, but, but you know, that will be also true this thing. Psi beta plus nabla beta psi alpha equals to zero. Okay, so you see that uh, if you want to have such a vector field, which gives a linear 
in the velocity conserved quantity along any geodesic, this vector field has to satisfy this equation. This is a famous killing, killing uh, vector equation. So, killing is a guy, we are not killing anybody. Uh, and so that's, that's the equation. Um, so, of course, you know, what we are saying here is that we want some conserved quantity for geodesics or something like that. Of course, according to Noether's theorem, you can have conserved quantities provided that you have the corresponding symmetries. And so this really, so psi alpha is really a continuous symmetry, as you know it uh, from Noether's theorem, describes a symmetry of the space-time. Because only when you have the symmetry, you can actually have the corresponding concept quantities. All right. So that's the first encounter. Uh, so the solution of this equation is called killing vector. Uh, not every space-time admits killing vectors, but some space-times do. And if we have killing vectors, if we have symmetries, it simplifies our life drastically because we know there will be some concept quantities and so on. OK, so that's the first encounter of killing vectors. And this is the simplest way how you can define a killing vector. So basically, this is a one. It, it can be, you know, it, it can serve as a definition of what killing vector is. Uh, and as I said, you will study killing vectors more, but from a different perspective. But you will see that they give the same. Questions? Uh, so the quantity corresponding to this killing vector is exactly C. It's so the corresponding like uh, conserved quantity that corresponds to the killing vector is exactly C. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so C is our conserved quantity, uh, and it's a uh, uh, very good. So, this is the conserved quantity for geodesics, conserved uh, quantity, and notice that it's linear, linear uh, in velocity u. Okay. So, so killing vectors give you uh, a linear in velocity conserved quantities for geodesic motion. So now there are generalizations of these killing vectors. You may discuss them next week. Uh, and, and so, for example, killing tensors. And they will give you quadratic uh, conserved quantities for, for geodesics, which are quadratic in the velocity, for example. All right. So now 2.6 EF, probably, curvature. So the last thing in order to formulate the Einstein equations is that we have to uh, we have to understand what curvature is, um, and so let me <coughs> just mention before. Of course, I can just start with the definition, but let me mention two vague motivations. Two vague well, one motivation is basically this one. So you you want to call the space really curved when this, this vector doesn't rotate, well, well, it rotates to something else. Um, so, but, but let me start with a different motivation. Let me start with a gauge, gauge theory. So we know that gravity is a gauge theory. And so it should be similar to electromagnetism or something like that. Uh, it's not really clear from the description we are using here. But you will learn in gravitational physics course that really gravity is a gauge theory, and it's money. You can you can write down a formalism where it is manifestly a gauge theory. So let's consider the standard gauge field. So consider consider uh, a mu, which is the gauge field. As you know it from electromagnetism or from Young Mills theory or whatever. Um, and then you can form out of this a covariant derivative, as you know it, covariant derivative. So if you want to couple things to electromagnetic fields, you just don't use the partial derivative, but you use the covariant derivative. 
and you have definitely seen that this is the covariant derivative, this is just a partial derivative plus uh, whatever the gauge field is. So now here, the gauge field, if you think about our covariant derivative, the covariant derivative in gravity is just partial derivative plus the gamma term. And we know that the gamma term is the connection. So in fact, when you write this, you are saying that the gauge field plays the role of the connection. The connection. OK, so we have this covariant derivative, which everybody has seen. And then what you may do is that you may consider the commutator of two such covariant derivatives, d mu d nu. So d mu d nu minus d nu d mu. Um, all right, so it has many terms. So, OK, let's write it. So it's d mu plus a mu, uh, d nu plus a nu minus uh, d nu plus a nu, d mu plus a mu. OK, so first of all, let's just look at the terms which don't have any a's in them. So we have d mu d nu minus d nu d mu. Is they are partial derivatives, they commute, so this is zero. So, so this d mu d nu minus d nu d mu, which is zero because the partial derivatives commute. Um, and then I have terms like d mu acting on a nu plus d mu acting on a nu. And then similarly, I have minus d nu acting on a mu. And finally, I will have terms which have two a's in them. So I'll have plus a mu a nu minus a nu a mu. OK? Very good. So we have 0. And then you can write this as a commutator a mu a nu. So now, if you are in electromagnetism, and so you're, yes? Uh, what about the a mu d nu terms and the a nu d mu? Uh, sorry, which terms? Uh, a mu d nu. A mu d nu. So am I cheating here? Um, a mu d nu. OK, I'll find those terms. Let's, let's proceed with this, and I'll find those terms later. OK, so we have this. Um, and so you can write this as a commutator. Of course, if you have just the electromagnetism, uh, a mu r, just numbers. And so the last term disappears. But if you have young Mills theory, each a mu carries its own d group with it. Um, and so this will not be 0. So, so now, if you remember, uh, the definition in the angle's theory, this is nothing else than the field strength f mu nu of the corresponding field. Okay, so again, if you are in electromag electromagnetism, this term is gone, and this is just the standard definition of f mu nu. So you see that provided those terms don't do anything, which I just didn't write, um, you are getting that the commutator is actually related to the field strength of the um, we're supposed to act uh, with this on a function or something. Yeah. So when we do that, I think we're going to lose the terms that we're missing anyway. So we're just going to get, because we're going to get a derivative acting on a nu times some f. Right. And when we write it out, we are just going to get this when we forget about the f later. So I'm just saying we're going to, when we act on a function with this, we're just going to lose the terms that we didn't write anyway. OK. That's, that's what I expect, yes. Thanks. All right, so so you see that you know just just playing with the covariant derivatives in the gauge theory, you can get uh, the uh, the field strength of the gauge theory. Okay, so now in gravity, as I said, it's not obvious in our formalism at all, but gravity is also a gauge theory, and it can be written as such. So, but it's only true if you introduce field binds, field binds. Uh, which are some fields which carry their internal index A. So mu is the standard index as we know it, but A is the internal index. 
uh, similar to that our A mu can have an internal index corresponding to whatever. And then we have a connection, connection um, omega mu, and again, it carries two internal indices, omega mu AB. So now, what this field bind is, is that if you can understand E as a square root of G. Okay, if you take the metric and square, take a square root of the metric, it's E. Well, more precisely, G mu nu is given by E A mu E B nu eta A B. So this is the flat metric. And, and so you see that, you know, you can sort of, any curve metric you can write it in a flat case, provided that you introduce these coefficients a, b, nu, and that's what field bind is. Okay. And the connection has to give you somehow a covariant derivative. So, so a connection. Uh, so if you want to calculate the covariant derivative of a vector e, b, you just get omega mu a, b, e, a. So this is just a number, this is a vector, this is a vector, covariant derivative of vector is another vector. Okay, so if you don't understand anything, that's fine, you will see this in gravitational physics course. Yes? But the local, uh, the, well, if you we're trying to write gravity as a gauge theory, uh, locally we would have um, Lorentz transformations always. So the elements of the algebra would be Lorentz transformation. That's what we want, yeah. But the global, uh, well, yeah, the glo the total symmetry of gravity is supposed to be diffeomorphism. Uh, not in this, not in this language. Really, the group which 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 really the symmetry which gravity has in this is precisely the Lorentz transformation in this description. Well, then so, it's yeah. not the same, right? Uh, it is the same. You, you will see in gravitational physics course, this will be discussed in detail, don't worry. So, so really, the statement is, if you want to write this as a, as a gauge theory, corresponding gauge group is like linear transformations, and linear transformations on this internal space. So that's the true symmetry of gravity, if you want to write it as a gauge theory. Uh, I, I don't want to discuss it now, So, but, but you will see it in... in so anyway, so now once we have these two objects, we can construct the covariant derivative, which is the partial derivative, plus my connection, omega mu. And then you can calculate the commutator, d mu, d nu. Um, so now you see that this mu is the indices a and b. So these indices a and b are still there. They will be there as well if I did write you know, a mu as a matrix. And so if you find it, uh, again, you commute the derivatives, you find that this is t mu omega nu a b plus minus d nu omega mu a b and then plus the commutator omega mu omega nu a b. And this is an object which has uh, the indices r mu nu a b. And it's precisely the curvature corresponding to uh, this connection. And as we will see that this, this curvature is precisely the Riemann tensor, which we'll introduce now, but, but now written in this internal indices uh, frame. All right, so that's the curvature of gravity. And you see that's you know it's very, very analogous to whatever we are doing there, we are doing here as well. Okay, so that was one way motivation. I have a question. Yeah. What's the relationship between this omega and the, the Christoffel symbol? You will see. <laughs> it's not exactly the same. It's not exactly the same. But so this thing. If you want, this is this is like a connection on this internal space. So whenever you see an index A or B, you you, you use the, the corresponding connection omega. Whenever you see index mu nu, you you use the corresponding index, uh, well, Christopher symbol instead. And then you connect these two by requiring that nabla mu e 
a new equals to zero. So if this is true, then you know you have to differentiate the index a, that's this this uh, with this this object omega, and you have to differentiate the index nu, which is through the Christopher symbol, and this has to be zero. So it gives you the connection between uh, the Christopher symbols and this spin connection. And why do you require this? Is that you require that nabla mu of g nu lambda equals to zero, but but g nu lambda is just a square e square, right? Apart from the metric. So so now you know you can definitely arrange that this is true provided that nabla mu on e is equal to zero. Because this is just twice that. Okay, so so this is how to satisfy the metricity condition, and it connects connects whatever the Christopher symbol is with whatever the connection of the guy is. Okay. But I'm really getting very far from <laughs> okay, so the motivation number two, which is basically a definition, but we will not use it as a definition because it takes some calculation to do, um, is that I really say that my Riemann tensor, my curvature tensor, is related to that picture above, so how the vector, uh, how the vector rotates. So motivation two... is how vector rotates as we parallel transport it along the closed loop. And so there you can sort of define that the, the new vector, so the, ve the vector v tilde and v, they are related by some delta v. Uh, and so this is how really what the rotation is, uh, and this must be given by the rotation of the original vector. Um, okay, v till nice. Okay. Rotation a b. This is very weak, but anyway, uh, and rho sigma uh, and v sigma. So now I compose the loop of a vector a and vector b, and then I go back a, and then I go back b. So now my vector, when you parallel transport it, goes to this one here, and there's some delta v here. And then there's also the parameters. So, so if I go along this loop, I have delta t parameter. If I go along that loop, I will have delta s parameter. So there should also be delta t and delta s. So let's not write it, and let's write proportionality fact, something like this. So how much the vector rotates, so this is the rotation matrix, and this is whatever I had before. Okay, but, but now you see that the rotation mat matrix is feeding in you know, information about the loop. It's feeding in the information about the vector A and vector B, and so it has to be linear in A and B because the closed, is actually, uh, uh, the closed loop is small. And so then you have that this is equal to R, rho sigma, alpha, beta, A alpha, B beta, B sigma. Okay? And this is it. So this object, which has four indices, you call the Riemann tensor. Riemann tensor. And of course, if this tensor vanishes, there is no rotation of the uh, uh, of the vector, right? So so you can sh you can define the curvature of the space time by saying, well, if this guy is zero, then we don't have any curvature. We have flat space because the vector always comes to the same thing. Okay, so that's that's that picture over there, and you can make it very precise if you want. Read Walt where the calculation is actually done. Uh, explicitly, or any other book. So, but you know, this is just the motivation. Very good. So now, of course, I'm I'm doing these vectors a and b here, but I could equally say I am doing a covariant derivative in this direction, a covariant derivative in that direction. So, equally, you can look at this picture as that I am 
sort of parallel transporting something along this way and that way, and then I parallel transport along this way and that way, and then I look at the difference here. But, but you can describe these things as the, the covariant derivatives nabla mu and nabla nu. So, so then you are interested in what happens if these, you know, when you commute these, these two covariant derivatives that connects the, the motivation one and one two. So now this was just the motivation which is very vague and, uh, and obscure and, and confusing. Let me just use a definition and I'll say that take a covariant derivative and, and its commutator and act with this on a vector v rho and then the statement is that this is given by r rho sigma mu nu v sigma and you call the object on the right hand side to be the Riemann tensor. So, you know, this thing should be somehow intuitively clear that it's basically what's written here, but also should be intuitively clear that I'm just commuting some covariant derivatives over here. So just, just you know, those are just fake motivations. But, but this is our definition here. Um, so by the way, if you look at this thing here, so I'm acting with two derivatives on the vector. Um, and then it's surprising that I'm getting only an absolute term, right? So I'm, I'm getting a term on the right hand side which has no derivatives whatsoever on that vector. Of course, if I expand this, I will have two partial derivatives and they will cancel each other because they commute. But I should also have one derivative terms. And so these one derivative terms, which is related to whatever you said, so one derivative terms terms do exist if you have non-trivial torsion. Uh, non-trivial torsion. And so what you would add on the right hand side is simply minus T sigma mu nu uh, nabla sigma v uh, rho. Okay, so this term would be on the right hand side in addition to that term uh, if we had torsion. But we don't have torsion. And so that's why. So two derivatives have to vanish because simply the commutator kills two derivatives. But the one derivative term is possible, uh, one derivative acting, uh, acting on my vector. And that's proportional to torsion, which we are setting equal to zero. So that's, that's why it is not there. And then the absolute term is given by the Riemann, uh, Riemann tensor. Okay, so that's the definition. Okay, so we have this huge beast. Um, and it's easy to convince yourself from this, from this definition that this beast actually contains two derivatives of the metric. So, or, so the Riemann tensor depends on the metric, on the first derivatives of the metric, and on the second derivatives of the metric. It also depends on the connection and on the first derivative of the connection. If you write down the indices in the right way, then you don't need metric. And you can define the Riemann tensor even without the metric. Okay, so it follows. It follows from the definition. that this object can be written R rho sigma mu nu equals to d mu gamma rho nu sigma minus d nu gamma rho mu sigma plus gamma rho mu lambda gamma lambda nu sigma minus gamma rho nu lambda gamma lambda mu sigma. Okay, so you just 
plug whatever the expression for the covariant derivative is and write it down explicitly, uh, you find that it contains the derivative of the connection and gamma gamma terms. So schematically, this is d gamma minus d gamma plus gamma gamma minus gamma gamma. Okay, so that's the structure of the Riemann tensor. Uh, and we shall see that uh, you can basically, so, so this is what you have to remember. And then you can just put the indices in, if you have time, to, to respect the symmetries of the Riemann tensor. We shall see what the symmetries are. Uh, but one thing which you can see is that it should be anti-symmetric in index mu and nu. So if you look at the first two terms, I have derivative with respect to mu and nu, but I have the same term, but now mu and nu are switched. So minus nu mu, so it's anti-symmetric in mu nu. And the same thing here, I have mu and nu, and then I swap them and nu and mu. So, so you immediately see that the object will be anti-symmetric in mu and nu indices. Okay. By the way, this is clear here as well from this definition as a rotation. So if I feed in, so, so the index mu and nu is now the index alpha and beta. So now if you feed in not two vectors a, a and b, but vectors a and a, so if I put here a beta here, so now this is symmetric. Uh, but if you put a vector a and then you come back with the vector a, you cannot get any, any rotation, right? Because you are just getting, you are no, not doing any loop. You are not doing anything. So this must be zero. And so that's why this must be anti-symmetric in an alpha and beta. If it were symmetric, it would, it would be zero. Okay, so, so we have some properties here. Uh, properties. And they are most easily discussed if you put all the indices down, so I can lower the index row here. So, so I'll define R alpha beta gamma delta to be simply G alpha alpha prime R alpha prime beta gamma delta. I'm just lowering the first index here uh, with the metric, and then I have an object with all indices down. And so now this object has beautiful symmetries in general relativity. So if you have this R alpha beta gamma delta, then the object is anti-symmetric in these two indices, as we already discussed. So if you switch gamma and delta, you get a minus. But it's also anti-symmetric in the first two indices. So if you switch alpha and beta, you also get a minus sign. Okay. But it's symmetric under the exchange of two and two indices. So if you take these two indices and take those two indices and you swap them, it's symmetric here. So what I'm just saying is that this is R gamma delta alpha beta. This is what I mean by swapping the two indices, uh, the, the sets of two indices. But also, this would be minus R delta gamma alpha beta, swapping the first two. And also, this is plus R delta gamma beta alpha when I'm swapping these two indices, for example. Okay? So, so just remember, it's anti-symmetric here, anti-symmetric here. But if I want to swap this and that, it, it's just symmetric. Okay? So that's the symmetries of this object. Um, well, this object better has lots of symmetries, because as we calculated yesterday, all we want to describe is 20 uh, second order derivatives of the metric. Um, so this object better has only 20 components. But of course, in general, this would have four to the four components, so lots of components. So we have to kill many, many components, and we kill them by the corresponding symmetries. OK, so that's the symmetries of the object. There's another symmetry is that if you, OK, let me write it this way, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta 
equals to zero. So if you, if you anti-symmetrize over all indices here, you get zero. Okay, that's another symmetry. And so that's it. So, so it's this, these symmetries here, plus this, uh, uh, this equality here, which are the symmetries of the Riemann tensor. Okay. By the way, people don't write it this way, typically. They write it as R alpha, beta, gamma, delta, cyclic permutation equal to zero. But this thing plus the anti-symmetry between alpha and beta actually give you that thing. Okay, so you know that the first two indices are anti-symmetric. So the anti-symmetry in the first two indices plus this guy give you that. Okay, so I would say that we have the property one here which is you know, this, this, and that. And then property two, which is this thing here. Uh, and then from one and two, this already follows. Follows from one and two. So now there is another identity which is true, and that's true when you differentiate, when you take a covariant derivative of this tensor. So you write R alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and then you make a covariant derivative with respect to another. So, so sometimes people also they know the covariant derivative is this, is this uh, sign here. And then you anti-symmetrize over uh, the three indices. Um, and then you find that this is equal to zero. And I don't write it here, do I? I don't write it at all. It's the Bianchi identity. And you take cyclic permutation, and then you get zero. Okay, that's another identity, but it's, this is a different, so that's an, uh, property number three. But this is a very, very different property. Uh, it's a differential property. So if I start differentiating the Riemann tensor and do the, the corresponding cyclic identity, you get zero. Okay, so these are the symmetries of the Riemann tensor. So now why these symmetries are interesting is, let's really co confirm that we have uh, 20 components of this Riemann tensor. Are there any questions so far? But as you have uh, locally uh, Minkowski space, you will have the Riemann tensor vanishing. Uh, 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 thank you for that question. I'll discuss it in a minute. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So, how many components? Uh, do we have for the Riemann tensor, and let's do it in in D dimensions so that we have a general formula. Okay, so to calculate how many components we have, we can only use the algebra algebraic properties of the Riemann tensor. So this is restricted, restricted, uh, by property one and property two. Okay. So now to calculate this is a lot of fun. So let me first let me look at this R alpha beta, R alpha beta, gamma and delta, in the following way. Let me combine uh, these two indices into some big index A, which takes several values, and then these indices into some big index B, which takes several values. <clears throat> okay, so now let, let us calculate how many values 
the index A can take and how many B can take. So how many A? So remember that the object is anti-symmetric in alpha and beta. So how many combinations in D dimensions uh, of two indices I can have? D minus one over two. Uh huh. Exactly. So index index A takes n equal to d over 2, which is d times d minus 1 over 2 uh, values. <coughs> because simply, the indices alpha and beta are anti-symmetric. And so I have, I have, yeah, I can have 0, 1, but I cannot have 0, 0 here. OK, so it takes n, which is d over 2 values. What about index b? The same. So index B takes again the same thing, the number of values. So now if I look at the object as an object R A B, do I have any symmetry? symmetry? Exactly. So the object is now symmetric in A and B. So I can swap these. So if each index um, take n values. How many values I have for the object R, A, B? N times N plus 1 over 2. Mm -hmm. So R, A, B can take N times N plus 1 over 2 uh, values. OK. However, we are still not done. We only use the property 1. Here, right? So now what about the property two? So the property two is saying, well, I have these four indices. When I completely anti-symmetrize them, I have to get zero. So how many restrictions I have? Anybody? So in D dimensions, I have four indices. I have an object which is completely anti-symmetric in four indices. D over 4. So, so 2 gives uh, D over 4 constraints. Right. So all these combinations of the indices have to be equal to 0. Very good. So now the number of components of Riemann, Riemann is whatever. I said here, so it's n times n plus 1, n times n plus 1 divided by 2, minus the number of constraints, minus d over 4. Um, but n is d times d minus 1 over 2. And if you actually write it down, you should find that this is d square over 12 times d square minus 1. OK, so that's the number of components of the Riemann tensor in D dimensions. <coughs> so now let's plug D equal to 4. D equal to 4. So it's 16 over 12. 16 over 12 times 15. And hopefully that's 20. Is it? Maybe. Yeah, 4, four times 5. It's 20. So we can claim the victory with uh, precisely 20 second order derivatives, second order derivatives of metric that we cannot get rid of by going to the freely falling system. That we cannot get rid of by equivalence principle. So very good. So we found actually how to write down these 
second order derivatives of the metric, which, which we cannot get rid of. And of course, because we cannot get rid of them, they better be described by a tensor. And so this tensor is the Riemann tensor here and true. So by the way, there is no any tensor which would contain only metric and the first derivatives of the metric. So you cannot you can form any such tensor. So now you have to go to higher derivatives. So in terms of the two derivatives, this is the only tensor which you can write down. And it's contraction, as we will see. Okay? But but there is no tensor which you would form out of the metric itself and the first derivative of the metric. Um, which is actually quite fun because it, 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 it tells you that uh, the analogy between gravity and electromagnetism actually has to end somewhere. Uh, and it's, this is the origin of why the action for electromagnetism is quadratic in F mu nu, but it's actually linear in the Riemann tensor. Okay. All right, so we calculated these things. So now, what is this tensor good for? Uh, so we intuitively understand that it describes the curvature of the space-time, uh, something which we cannot get rid of by going to the freely falling system. So now there is a theorem, which I'll just state and don't prove. And that is the importance of that. So let's let's so flatness. So first a definition. Definition um, space time is flat if there exists exists a coordinate transformation transformation such that uh, which brings which brings the metric metric into Minkowski metric into Minkowski metric. So G equals to eta after we do this coordinate transformation. Uh, well, what the, hell, what the hell is going on, right? We said we can always do it at a point. Uh, so no matter whether the space is curved or not, whether it's flat or not. But what, what is the difference here is that this is not at a point, but it's everywhere. Or at least in some finite and in some finite region. So you would say that the space-time is flat in that region. Uh, but yeah, let's let's do it everywhere. So so we say that the space-time is flat when we can do this everywhere, when we can always transform, but we can find such a transformation which brings the metric into the flat metric everywhere. Okay, so now here comes uh, the exercise or you know a motivation for an exam by a teacher who is really <laughs> not nice to you is that what they can do is that they can give you a metric, whatever the met metric they give you, and then they say, can you actually check that the space-time is flat? Can you, can you check, can you find the corresponding coordinate transformation which would bring uh, the metric into the flat form? Okay, and then you know, the student starts calculating and starts you know, trying various coordinate transformations. And of course, if the, uh, the space-time is not flat, you will not be able to find the transformation, but it's very difficult to, <laughs> to prove that you cannot find the transformation. Uh, and you can sp spend infinite num uh, amount of time actually doing that. So, so anyway, so there must be a criterion which tells you, well, without actually finding this, this coordinate transformation explicitly, is my space-time flat or not? And that's precisely what the Riemann tensor is good for. So there is a theorem, theorem, 
where it says uh, that the space time, space time is flat if and only if uh, the Riemann tensor vanishes. Everywhere. <coughs> okay, so now this actually gives you some procedure how to actually show that maybe this cannot be done. Is that all you have to do is that you calculate the rebound tensor for the following metric that the teacher gave you. Um, and once you calculate this Riemann tensor, and of course you can calculate it in any reference frame you want, in, in any coordinates you want, because it's a tensor. And if it vanishes in one coordinate system, it will vanish everywhere. But uh, it will vanish in any coordinate system. So you, you can check you know, whether such a transformation actually exists. And if it does, then you can start, uh, start trying, but it still can take a lifetime to actually find that corresponding transformation. Anyway, so we have this. Um, and so that's basically the importance of the Riemann tensor. So I hope that that answers Anisia's question. Okay. Other questions to this? So who hasn't seen this? Oh, some people. That's good. That's good. All right, so now we have the Riemann tensor and describes the curvature and tells me whether the space time actually is flat or not. Um, now we can con construct out of this tensor other useful tensors. Um, so if you read we need a pool, then this rabbits and relations. And hints of Riemann family. So if you read the we need we need to prove that we know that there was also the creature named small and the small entered the bush one you know, on one side, and he didn't appear on the other side, and nobody knew where, where he was, okay? So anyway, so now what, 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 what type of tensors you can, you can form out of this Riemann tensor? And so the first one is the Ricci tensor, which is simply R mu nu, an object with two indices, which you get by contracting uh, first and third index of the Riemann tensor. Okay, so you can check that this is symmetric on your mu, so it is symmetric in, in two indices, um, and as such, it has d times d plus one over two components. Okay, so that's the Ricci tensor, was known a long time ago. Then you can contract the index once more. So, so if you look at this thing here, again, I don't really need a metric to construct uh, the Ricci tensor because the Riemann tensor as we define it had one index up. So it had index one up and then you had three indices down and all I'm doing, I'm contracting these two indices. Also, you know that the Riemann tensor could be written entirely in terms of the Christopher symbols and their derivatives. That's the formula over there. So, so the, the Riemann tensor only depends on gamma and d gamma. Uh, and because this guy does, this is simply a function of gamma and d gamma, but it doesn't, you don't need really metric, right? So it doesn't, doesn't really depend on the metric if, if you don't have the metric. So, so this is true. So R mu can be understood entirely as a function of the 
of the connection. So now you have this other thing, which is the richest scalar. Scalar. Um, and that one is simply R, which is R mu mu, which is G mu nu R mu nu. So now for this guy, you need a metric because the metric enters explicitly here. So now this thing is a function of both. It's a function of the metric and of the, uh, of the connection. But actually, the functional dependence of the metric is only through this guy here. Right? That's the only, only place where the metric enters. Okay? This will be important for the variational principle. Okay? So we have these two very important answers. Um, and finally, you can form their combination, and that's called Einstein tensor. So this thing, of course, has one component because it's a scalar. One component in any number of dimensions. And finally, we have the Einstein tensor. Ah, it works. <laughs> Einstein tensor. And that's g mu nu equals to r mu nu minus one half r g mu nu. Okay. That's another tensor. And what is particularly nice about this combination of the Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar is that if you look at this differential property of the Riemann tensor, so the property number three here, you see that I differentiate the Riemann tensor with a covariant derivative, and then some cyclic permutation gives me zero. So it follows from the property three. So now you want to apply this to this Einstein tensor, but Einstein tensor contains Ricci and Ricci scalar, so it's some contraction of indices of the, of the Riemann tensor. So you have to contract indices in that identity. Doesn't matter which indices, except those which are antisymmetric, which would give you zero. Um, but if you uh, contract any other indices, uh, the identity three gives you a marvelous, marvelous identity for the Einstein tensor, and it's this one here. So this is the Bianchi identity for the Einstein tensor. Bianchi identity. Uh, for the Einstein tensor. And this has the far-reaching consequences um, for general relativity, as you will see. So if you want, uh, you know, this, this is what people considered before, Ricci, Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar. But if you form such a nice combination with the two, you get a new tensor, which is useful for Einstein. So it's called Einstein tensor. Uh, and the most useful property of this tensor is that it satisfies this Bianchi identity. All right, finally, there is another tensor, uh, which is also useful for many things. And that's called wild tensor. And you will discuss it. That's beautiful. We have new blackboards. Should have checked that at the beginning. Uh, so wild tensor. Um, and you will have the precise definition in your tutorial. But basically, what you can do is that you can write Riemann. So while tensor we have, will have four indices. It will have C, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Um, so it looks like the Riemann tensor. And it has the same symmetries as the Riemann tensor. So if you take the algebraic symmetries of the Riemann tensor, uh, it will be antisymmetric here, antisymmetric here. And then if you swap the two, uh, so, so it has the same, same symmetries, same symmetries, uh, as Riemann. But in addition, it has uh, an extra symmetry, which or extra property, where you. If you look at how you form the Ricci tensor, 
you simply contracted the first and the third index in the, in the Riemann tensor. So now let me do it here. So I have C alpha, beta, alpha, delta here. Let's call it C beta, delta. So this will be like a Ricci tensor for, uh, from, from my wild tensor. And so the defining property of the wild tensor is it is the same symmetries as Riemann plus the corresponding Ricci vanishes. Okay, so that's the defining property of this of this wild tensor. Okay. So same symmetries as Riemann plus this property here. So now you can show that once you have this tensor, you can actually write schematically Riemann is Ricci plus while. So you can decompose information about the curvature of the space-time into two parts, into the part which is contained in the Ricci tensor and into the part which is, which is contained in the wild tensor. These are very, very different. They describe different things. Um, as you will see, the Einstein equations tell you directly about what the Ricci is. Um, and so people design a, an ingenious technique how to solve Einstein equations. Is that, well, in the end, the Einstein equations will solve for the metric. And so the metric tells you about the curvature. So, so you can simplify your life by, setting, you know, by saying that this while is simple. And so there, is, there exists some, uh, the so-called algebraic classification of the while tensor. So you consider the while tensor as a matrix. And then you consider the corresponding eigen eigenvectors and eigenvalues and stuff like that. And if it has nice eigenvectors and eigenvalues, it is algebraically special. So there's an algebraic, algebraic uh, classification of this, classification of the while tensor, classification of the while tensor. And so if you have special algebraic type, algebraic type, uh, allows one to simplify Einstein equations. Simplify uh, Einstein equations, as we will see them later on. And you can actually solve these Einstein equations. And so that's how the rotating black hole space-time, the Kerr metric, was found by Kerr. He was just simply looking. He was a mathematician. He didn't do anything about physics. He was just a mathematician and an imposed. Well, I have some special, special algebraic type for my wild tensor. What are the corresponding solutions of Einstein equation? And he found thousands of solutions, and they are not useful for anything except one. It's the Kerr metric, which was found by this you know, mathematical method. Um, and interestingly, there is no physical derivation of Kerr metric until now. It's not like I. I so if you say, I want to describe a field of a rotating black hole as my physical assumption, can I find the metric? Nobody knows how to do it, right? But there's this mathematical uh, derivation which says, OK, let's study you know, objects which have special wild tensor. Then actually, a metric happens to be one of them. OK, so it's just a historical introduction. So we have this wild tensor. Um, and so what is this wild tensor? And I'm saying, you know, this captures different, you know, these two things capture different features of the curvature of the space-time. But while tensor has importance on its own, and there is another theorem, theorem, uh, which says that uh, while vanishes everywhere if, it's an analog of the theorem for the Riemann tensor, if and only if, um, Space time is conformally flat. Conformally flat. And that means that there exists a coordinate system where my metric can be written as some function times the flat metric. Okay. So we know that if the Riemann tensor vanishes everywhere, then the space-time must be flat. So there exists a coordinate transformation where g mu equals to eta mu. 
So now if the while tensor vanishes, uh, you get slightly slightly weaker condition. It's almost flat metric, except there can be a function which multiplies this flat function. So now this actually tells you that uh, while tensor has to do something with the with the conformal symmetry. So conformal symmetry is a symmetry where you change the metric by going so conformal symmetry. Conformal symmetry of something is that I change the metric g mu nu to omega square g mu nu, and then nothing happens. You know, uh, everything stays the same. So there are conformal field theories which enjoy the symmetry, um, and one of them is the string theory. Okay, so so that's that's a conformal symmetry. All right, and so this that's encoded somehow in the wild tensor. By the way, the wild tensor, if you write it in this form, C alpha, beta, gamma delta. If you write it in this form, with one index up, the first index is up. So now you calculate this object for my metric g mu nu, and then you calculate this object for my new metric g mu nu related by conformal symmetry and by conformal transformation. So I calculate the same object with now omega square g mu nu. This object doesn't change at all. So under a conformal transformation, this thing stays the same. So actually, the wild tensor is symmetric under conformal transformations, provided one index is up. Okay, so under this conformal transformation, the metric doesn't change. So the last thing I want to discuss in the remaining five minutes is that I provided to you a heuristic derivation of the Einstein equation at the end of our first look at GR section. So, and then I said, okay, so it's the uniqueness, uniqueness of Einstein, Einstein equations, if you want. So what we argue is that we are looking for a tensor, let's call it d mu nu, which depends on the metric, on the first derivative of the metric, and the second derivative of the metric, so that it, this is equal to 8 pi g newton uh, t mu nu, right? And so what we required is that, well, we require that this thing actually reduces in the static limit and Newton, you know, Newtonian limit, weak field limit, and so on, it reduces to the Laplace equation. So nabla square on phi, 4 pi, g Newton, uh, the matter density. So in the, the Newtonian limit. So we were looking for such a tensor d mu nu which reduces in the Newton limit to this thing here. But at the same time, well, we knew that this energy density is just T0, 0, 0 component of my energy momentum tensor. Um, and so we knew that the energy momentum tensor better be conserved. So in nabla mu on T mu nu equals to 0. So conservation, conservation of T mu nu, namely nabla mu T mu nu equals to zero, sort of motivates that this tensor better be conserved as well. It implies that we better have nabla mu uh, D mu nu equals to zero as well. So in other words, we are looking for, you know, a tensor D mu nu, which in the Newtonian limit gives Double square on phi, where phi is just GTT component uh, related to the GTT component of the metric. 
but also which, which satisfies this Bianchi identity here, nabla mu d mu nu equals to zero. So now I said, you can ask your, uh, your, your friend who is a mathematician, you know, what, what type of tensors I can have, what this d mu nu can be. So now we see that we have one answer here. We know that the Einstein tensor, which gives this, you know, this, this weird combination of the Ricci tensor and Ricci scalar, satisfies this property. Okay, so Einstein tensor, Einstein tensor is an example of this. Of the mu. So certainly satisfies the Bianchi identity. What I haven't shown you uh, yet is that it's, it, it gives, uh, it gives th that equation here. But yeah, it actually does. Okay, so, so you know, this is certainly a candidate. And so we should have, we could have an equation g mu nu equals to 8 pi g t mu nu. However, this is not the only solution. And there is obviously another solution. So I can take my g mu nu and add lambda times the metric thing. So provided lambda is a constant, provided lambda is a constant, this thing will satisfy the Bianchi identity as well. So this would be another example of d mu nu. And simply, if I take nabla mu, well, this is 0. Lambda is a constant, so it doesn't do anything. But then I have nabla mu g mu nu, but, but metric has 0 metricity. So whatever the covariant derivative I take of the metric, I'll get zero, right? So, so actually, this time is certainly possible. Uh, it satisfies this property. And it will not really mess this thing here, provided the lambda is rather small. So if this constant is small, so that actually it's much smaller than whatever the Newtonian limit would give us, so it will be some small correction due to smallness of lambda, then it will not mess, mess this equation, the Newtonian equation. Okay. So, you know, as long as it doesn't mess the Newtonian limit for some reason, uh, I, I can have this term here. And so it tells you that in principle, uh, my Einstein equations could read g mu nu plus, so g mu, okay, let me write g mu nu, which is r mu nu minus one half r g mu nu, that's g mu nu, plus lambda g mu nu equals to 8 pi g t mu nu. And so that's the Einstein equation as, uh, as you can write it in, in generality. There is nothing else. This is, this is it. So that's the only freedom of you know, satisfying this thing is that you add this lambda times g mu nu term. That's the only freedom you have. Okay. So of course, this constant lambda uh, is the infamous cosmological constant. Okay. This is the infamous cosmological constant. And it's something which Einstein called the biggest blunder of his life. Um, because he simply, you know, introduced this. Well, okay, so he didn't have the term first. Um, he just had Jimmy new, and then for some reason he introduced this term. And then he said, well, the term actually doesn't make any sense. So he actually got rid of that term again. And then, you know, this, this came up, you know, several times. Um, and of course, in the end, it turns out that we do see lambda in our universe. So as we will study in your cosmology course, you'll see that actually uh, the simplest explanation for our universe is that we have lambda, which is positive and really, really small. So so although Einstein said this is the biggest blunder of his life, actually it turns out that lambda does exist in our universe. And he sort of said that uh, it could be here. 
Uh, of course, he introduced it for stupid reason. He wanted the universe to be static. And so, so we basically tune the values so that the universe is static and does, is not moving. Of course, we know that the universe is not static. The universe is expanding. But still, lambda is there. So now, what is actually really, really interesting is that if you try to predict the value of lambda from some theory, let's say quantum field theory, um, and you look at the magnitude of what lambda should be, uh, it's basically corresponding to vacuum fluctuations of your fields. You calculate you know, the prediction for lambda, and then you compare to observations, and then you find that you are off by a small number, which is 10 to 120. <laughs> OK, so this is the, so the prediction of the theory is 10 to 120 times bigger than the actual value. OK, and this is called the cosmological constant problem. Cosmological constant problem. Which basically tells you, well, nobody knows what lambda is uh, or what's going on. But if you just take and believe your quantum field theory, simply the vacuum fluctuations should have, you know, should contribute to lambda, which is 10 to 120 times bigger than the actual observed value of lambda. And so you will discuss this in the cosmology course. But of course, you will not resolve the problem because nobody knows how to resolve the problem. OK, so that's, that's actually waiting for you. So let me stop here. So we can have lambda in the Einstein equations. Actually, in the universe, we do, have, we do see lambda, but we don't have any theoretical explanation for its value. Um, and it's allowed by the symmetries. Questions, comments? All right, see you in the afternoon.